to this expert session on urban air mobility, on which we will focus on user needs and acceptance. And I don't want to give you a very long introduction with defining all the technical terms or abbreviations that you might encounter when you are getting interested or for the first time in touch with the urban air mobility world. But what I would like to clarify is we call this panel urban air mobility. And in a very strict sense of or definition, would only focus on passenger transport. But we also want to open the discussion a bit uh, and also focus on cargo and delivery of drones. So we will cover all of that. So um, is urban air mobility really something that is far away in the future or is it a reality that might be actually around the corner? And uh, I think it is way closer than most of the people think. Paris is uh, implementing urban air mobility for the Olympic Games next year. So that is actually very, very soon. And we will hear a lot of different other nice examples today. And uh, the first operations will be expected to be um, the delivery of goods, then for, um, for passenger transport, it will focus, it will first be with a pilot and then later be uh, remote piloting before it is expected to be a fully autonomous service. That, that is what is expected so far. So, um, last year at the Urban, Am uh, Urban Mobility Days and the Urban Air Mobility panel, we received a lot of questions and that actually focused a lot on acceptance and user needs and this is why we wanted to dedicate a whole panel on it and we actually collected questions that were asked last year via Slido um, and we were not able to answer due to a lack of time. We collected them and I will actually ask them today so that we can continue the discussion we had last year. So we appreciated a very interactive discussion last year and uh, this is also why we would like to join you um, to, uh, to use Slido. You can just scan the QR, QR code, I think that's the easiest, and start typing in your questions from the very beginning. We have reserved a very long time slot at the end uh, of the session, so <coughs> you make sure that we can get uh, to you on your questions um, as to the extent possible. Um, so we would also like to first, before we start with the panel discussion, to get a bit of a feeling who's in the room. And there we have a very first question to you. And that is actually, we would like to know, what is your knowledge on urban air mobility? And you can say, I know nothing about it. I, I work in the sector, so rather technical expert. Okay. So the majority has heard about it, uh, and the rest is more or less the same between experts, and I know little or nothing. That's very good. Perfect. Then uh, let me introduce our panelists. Um, I'm very happy to have Daniel Garcia Monteavaro, who is head of the drone business development and at Ener. Ener. <laughs> he has been in the air navigation sector for more than 20 years since 2018, and he is the head of the drone business development department. From this unit, he coordinates the definition and deployment of Ener's use based platform as well as the participation in national and European drone and use space projects. He is involved in regulatory activities and other actions related to the commercial development of use space services for UAS, both at national and international level. Welcome, Daniel. Then we have uh, Kai Bauer, who is Principal Advisor at the European Aviation Safety Agency, EASA. Kai is responsible for strategic sustainable actions, including the Innovative Air Mobility Hub project. Um, and he's previously launched the agency's environmental label program and served as head of environment department in EASA's certification directorate. Welcome, Kai. 
<laughs> then we uh, have Astrid, Dr. Astrid Sorg, who is um, the managing director at movin.net and the cluster manager mobility in the Hessen region. So Astrid is the head of the mobility cluster and managing the mobility and logistics network in northern Hessen, Germany since 2015. Prior to that, she was working and teaching at Kassel University on innovation and development. Welcome, Astrid. I'm also happy to have uh, Patrick van Eckmann, uh, who is managing director of Lux Mobility, a privately owned transport and mobility consultancy based in Luxembourg. And he's a transport expert with a specialization in the field of sustainable mobility and innovation with over 20 years of experience. He manages several expert teams in Luxembourgish, European, Middle East, and African transport and mobility projects. Very good to have you as well, also for the link to the urban mobility and the urban air mobility. Welcome, Patrick. And then I'm also very pleased to have Gerd van Weg, our, um, the president of the International Federation of Pedestrians. Gerd's focus is on making walking and other sustainable modes, such as cycling and using public transport, the mode of choice. Making public space not only safe and equitable, but also comfortable and enjoyable makes it possible for citizens to make that choice. Welcome, Gerd. I'm very uh, happy to have you this year on the panel. Uh, Gerd was very active last year in the UAM session. Uh, that was very, very, very nice. And uh, yesterday we also had a huge, uh, a big panel on urban space, actually, uh, where we discussed how to allocate that. So this is or to reallocate it to shift away from the car-centered focus. And this is also we have to take into account, I think, when we speak about urban air mobility. So um, <coughs> as I said, the slide was open. You can start typing in your questions. And then I would like to start actually with Astrid. Um, do you think citizens are aware of urban air mobility? And do you have some examples on where UAM is already being implemented? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, interestingly, we have been um, seeing differences in how, how knowledgeable the public general is about urban air mobility. We have been running um, an, an EU project, Horizon 2020 funded over the past three years. Um, also partner Lux Mobility present in this project. And um, we have been researching the role uh, of drones and medical emergency services. And cities are, for example, Helsinki, Stockholm, uh, Stavanger, um, Luxembourg is a partner, just to mention the, the spread in Northern um, Europe, and also Kassel, Germany. And here we have been conducting, among others, uh, surveys also about, you know, not only public acceptance, but how knowledgeable are people about UAM services. And that our study of that um, very project found that um, the general public doesn't yet know very much about AM as such. Um, and then if asked yeah, about benefits, it's still uh, hesitant. And then if, if accepted, it's rather, you know, um, that a need may be seen in emergency services. So here, um, here there is an agreement that this, this, this can serve as benefits. So the picture varies really from the cities where we have been conducting also surveys, but um, general answer is it's still, it's still not that, that spread, the word. <laughs> Patrick, do you, would, would you like to add on this? Uh, no, yeah, no, I thank you, uh, thank you for, uh, for having us here. I see that there's already a double number of people in the room than, uh, than I saw the last year. So, so I think it, it, people become aware of it. That's very good because urban air mobility is arriving. Uh, I think in two years' time, you will have the first commercial flight. So I think as cities, you need to be involved because they will fly in your, over your cities or your suburban areas. So it's better to be part of the discussion and to see where we can go in. So as Astrid said, we have done, uh, after EASA, who had done in 2021, a very good uh, study on public acceptance already. We repeated that in the Airmore project. We had two stratified sample of 2,500 citizens in the Netherlands, Germany, Luxembourg, Norway, Stavanger. No, that's in Norway. Um, <laughs> in Finland, we asked people what they think about uh, urban air mobility through certain cases. And we actually found out that indeed a lot of people are not still very aware what it is about 
with the exception of the YouTube videos on Amazon or uh, what now happens in the war in uh, Ukraine, how drones, uh, drones are being used. So they're not very knowledgeable, like I think most cities are not very knowledgeable. So they have to first get very knowledgeable on it. And during the demonstrations that we did in the in Helsinki, Stavanger, uh, North Hesse, uh, and also the well, the presentation of the of, of these drones to the general public in, in Luxembourg, we found out that the first questions that they have were up front was about safety. Does this fly safe? Does this go somewhere? Uh, can that not be cyber attacked or something like that? But once that we have seen flying it, then they get the feeling of, okay, this is uh, something that can fly and that's safe to be able to fly. And then questions come up about sustainability, which is also, I think, part of this, uh, this discussion. And, uh, well, I think, uh, happy to, uh, to you. speak about that. Kai, mm. from your perspective, uh, working at the ASA, do you think that citizens are aware of urban air mobility and what's your expert view from the regulatory side and certification side? Yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot for, for that question. Um, I, I think... Um, I'm not sure if the microphone is... I think it fell. <laughs> right, it's, it's down. Yeah. I think I probably need some help with the audio. Yeah. Could, could Maybe it's mind. coming now? That's yeah. Better. <laughs> you got it? Um, yeah. Yes, so th thanks for that question. I think you, you can hear me now better. Um, so I th what, what we do see is, is really a very quick increase in the, in the, in the understanding from, from citizens and, and the interest of citizens in, in uh, innovative air mobility, as, as we call it. Um, we do see that in different indicators. We, we've done a survey that was already mentioned uh, to understand uh, what, what, what really um, is, is the current understanding and, and where people see the benefits um, and and what is the general attitude towards this new uh, form of mobility. And it was, it was surprisingly positive. I mean, it was in the order of 83% uh, as, as a survey result, where across Europe, uh, and quite consistent across the different cities, that, that people are generally positive uh, about new possibilities of transport, very broadly speaking. Um, and um, and that, that was then translated, of course, into clear guidance. Okay, they, they wanted to have a, a clear benefit to citizens. Uh, that was the second thing that we found in the survey. So. As a, as a regulatory uh, body, we, we of course you know, have to ask people because we don't interact necessarily with citizens all the time. Um, but what we do, and maybe that's, it's worth to say a little bit on, on, on what we do, I don't know to what extent you, you are all um, aware of what EASA does in, in the first place. Uh, so, so EASA is, is the European uh, Aviation Authority, uh, which means that we are certifying uh, anything in, uh, in aviation. Uh, so that means that we are um, similar to I'm afraid. Yes, it does. So the first thing about uh, technology is you learn is that you also have to, to expect uh, uh, improvements uh, to happen when uh, the, the errors are uh, identified and you can work on innovating on those errors. So now it seems like to, to work much better. Um, so just a, a word around what the role of EASA is. Uh, so EASA is, is Europe, Europe's um, uh, aviation authority, which means that what we do is similar to... Um, what our colleagues in the medical agency do for the vaccines, right? So there was, before the COVID vaccines were, 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 were able to be used across Europe, they were tested for safety, uh, and that was done by uh, the, the medical agency, um, and they basically certified it for use across Europe. And, and that's exactly what EASA does for everything aviation, the, the, the aircraft, um, and also the, the rules and the standards that apply to uh, the operation, uh, the, the, the pilot licensing and the like. So that's basically our, our, our remit. Now that is pretty far away, of course, from what, what you experience then in, in, in cities and what we expect in cities, but we have been um, translating this in a proportionate manner into a a system that allows these kind of operations to happen. And that's why also I will say we, we actually do have a crystal ball. We know what, what is happening today in Europe because we are certifying the, the products, these, these things that fly around, and, and we are the member states uh, that, that, that are a part of this system. They are authorizing the individual operations in every state. So we have a good view from that, the crystal ball, if you like. 
uh, on, on what is actually happening in terms of the, the operations. Um, so so we, we see the increased awareness, uh, and I think this 80% that we saw today is pretty representative there. Uh, and of course, people don't exactly know what it's all about. But trust me, within aviation, within cities, nobody really knows what it's all about when they're starting with this. Uh, this is innovation, yeah? so it's, it's a new area of, of work. And, um, coming maybe to the use cases then uh, that, that you, you asked about, so, so what, what, what actually is happening, what it's actually used for, is we see, in a nutshell, the entire range of human ingenuity to use these new things for different things. Uh, so we see a lot for, for drone usage, especially in cities, you know, I mean, we're here in a a very, very, uh, very important uh, port city, a lot of history around the port. So drones are being used inside the port to, for surveillance, to understand what the, and support the logistics within the port, both in terms of surveillance, but also in putting things within the port. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that we see. Anything with medical, we, I'm sure we hear more about that in a, in a minute. We, we see a lot of, of that happening across Europe being, being authorized. We see things that we didn't expect. Um, guess what was the most uh, um, commonly authorized, or the highest number of authorizations in France over the summer. Somebody knows? For drone operations, it was um, drone shows. Because, because uh, people are replacing fireworks with drone shows above the cities. So this is something we didn't see coming. And then, okay, we were dealing with it, and, but it's, it's happening a lot, uh, this kind of... Uh, really innovation, where as a regulator, of course, we, we, we don't know what, what is actually uh, in uh, happening, but our job is, of course, to make sure that the rules make, make sure that they are safe uh, and sustainable um, and privacy is protected. Uh, these are the, the key elements that also came out of our survey that we're dealing with. Yeah? So we have now a European consistent regulatory framework that ensures the safety, the security, uh, the privacy with different actors taking their role from, from the Commission to EASA as the, as the aviation regulator to the member states who are authorizing the operations, and then in the cities, the, of course, the local authorities are involved in terms of firefighting, police, uh, surveillance. So, so we, have, we do have, I, I would like to say, a, a, a very uh, um, a framework in Europe that allows um, you in the cities to take control of this and make sure that whatever you put in your sump, your, your urban mobility plans, actually, you know, uh, is then um, where, where urban air mobility can, can <coughs> play a role in these areas. So the system is ready there for that, and, and it's, um, I think the conversation here will be all about how, how we make that really um, a beneficial for every citizen. Thank you very much. So we already touched up on a lot of points, I think, especially um, the, the use cases, the sustainability was mentioned, uh, the certification that is underway, uh, I, un underway but uh, also the some, most of the important regulations are already in place to actually enable cities to use, a, to implement a use base, but to have this possibility and to really do it, we uh, still see a huge gap. Um, and we might, we will come back late, to this uh, later, but now I would like to proceed with Gerd um, from your perspective. What are the most significant barriers that could prevent urban air mobility from being su successfully implemented in cities? Um, well, maybe first let's uh, decide what urban air mobility is. So, uh, I mean, dropping some life-saving blood somewhere in the mountains in, in Rwanda, that is not urban air mobility. Um, the drone shows you were mentioning, that's not urban air mobility. The, the fire brigade that sends a drone somewhere to the scene to, to, to have a good idea of what happens there, that's a fantastic use of drones, but that's not urban air mobility. So, I mean, what are we talking about? Well, maybe the medical uh, uh, niche market, which, which is oft, very often quoted, but which I think is still a very uh, much niche market. But, I mean, are we really thinking about having my pizza or my new iPhone uh, delivered to me uh, at home or having beamed me up to, uh, to my office somewhere in the city? I mean, if that is urban air mobility, we maybe should not thinking about how we can take away the barriers, but maybe we should ask a few questions before that from do we need it, do we want it? Um, I mean, do, do the cities need it? Do the citizens want to have that? Is it a kind of a, a solution looking for a problem? Uh, what is the problem? Is the problem congestion? Well, I mean, if 0.1% if or whatever of the, of the mobility is done by drones or something like that, this congestion will still remain there for 99% of the people, so we're not solving congestion. 
um, maybe for a happy few. But I mean, and then with the happy few, there's a very important point about equity. I mean, how are we assuring that we bring some equitable thing to the, to the city? I mean, if I have a nice garden in my uh, place, then I can have my new iPhone delivered in my garden. If I don't have a garden and only a kind of uh, uh, a house straight on, on, on the sidewalk, I can have it delivered on my doorstep. If I live on the fourth floor in an apartment building without terraces, how is that iPhone going to be delivered to my place? So the whole issue about equity there plays, I think, an extremely important uh, role. And then we also look like, have to look like the external costs, I mean, like we should do with all uh, mobility modes, and which we do absolutely not enough, generally spoken. Uh, so, I mean, when I talk about my doorstep, actually I speak, I'm talking about public space, the sidewalk, where a lot of people are walking there. Are we going to have drones hanging there, waiting till I come outside to, to pick up my, my new iPhone? Uh, also, with, with the, hail, the Verti ports, I mean, if you want to have a system where people can move from one way like to another, maybe like a sort of kind of taxi system, you're basically requiring a lot of vertiports somewhere in the city. So how many square meters do we need just to get these, these vertiports, the, the safety thing, maybe the, 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 the loading for those, uh, the, the charging of those uh, uh, VTOLs? Uh, I mean, all those square meters in, in a city which is already dense, I mean, isn't it not better to use that space for, for parks, for seating, for, for citizens, instead of for a happy few to bring them kind of from one place to another? So. As long as we have not answered those questions, I don't think we should be starting talking about from how do we take away barriers. Uh, that's the next question, I think. Thank you very much. Um, it all comes back to our urban um, space. <laughs> um, Daniel, which mobility problems on the ground can urban air mobility actually solve? Okay, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this panel. Uh, I want to introduce uh, first uh, the company, because it's not known by everyone. Enaire is the Spanish National Air Navigation Service Provider. So if you come here by plane, you, their traffic control was done by, by Enaire. Um, well, I'm going to take the results about the, the solution or what problems can be solved in uh, the problems at ground, and I'm going to take the results from, Kai mentioned the, the ASA study of social acceptance, because I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting, because the social acceptance uh, was uh, some of the cases, for instance, and has been mentioned sometimes, is the emergency assistant, the reduced time assistant, is something that can be improved a lot uh, if there's some kind of traffic jam, congestion, etc. So in a life death situation, I think the time is, is quite important. Something that is also mentioned is the traffic jams. It's true that traffic jams is not, is not going to be resolved with urban mobility, but it's something that can be a solution for uh, some people that need an emergency, not emergency, or, or they, have, they need to move uh, fast to one point to another, and you can give a solution that nowadays is impossible. In some cities, at certain time, it's impossible. In, on that, in that case, at least in a, in a first moment. Also, the pollution. The pollution uh, is going to be resolved leader by leader with electric, uh, the electric vehicles, and the urban air mobility, of course, have also to, to, um, to be on board of the electric, uh, the electric uh, solution. So, so that's the idea also, to, to help in, in that matters. And something that is not very specific, maybe of urban environment, but it's the regional air mobility also. So to extend uh, this kind of, of transport and facilities also to isolated regions or remote regions. So uh, it's something quite interesting. In Africa, it's a reality. I, will, I mentioned it's not urban air mobility, but it's something that going, uh, is extended because in Europe, uh, this urban air mobility is inside the innovative air mobility. Innovative air mobility gathers everything, the urban air mobility, the regional air mobility, international mobility. So, so I think that's, uh, that is uh, one of the main solutions for uh, comparing to, to the ground situations nowadays. 
And of course, because uh, NIR is a uh, air traffic uh, service provider, we are very interested in the airspace integration. So how is going to be the compatibility of these drones, air taxis that are going to fly very close to the cities, but in the same airspace as with other users, like helicopters, police or helicopters, uh, other kind of flights, and even, uh, in some cases, close to the airports. So uh, that's the reason that uh, there are many initiatives in, uh, in a global point of view under the ICAO, the Civil Aviation, the International Civil Aviation Authority, uh, about how to deal with this kind of transport. And in the specific case in Europe, uh, EASA has published a regulation that is uh, related to the concept of U-space. U-space is a concept that is very well known in aeronautical environment, but is not well known in from a public, uh, in the public society, in the general society, society. How is this Congress that is more general? So I want to introduce briefly about U-space, that uh, is, all, is a regulation that is in place, and it gathers uh, the digital services that has to be in place in a specific volume for the operations of uh, drones. Right? In the future, will be also for uh, air taxis, but in the first uh, phase, will be uh, only for drones, only for, for your knowledge, and you can search it very easily in, in internet about what is US space. Thank you very much. Um, so we, we see we, we are already there to some uh, point, a certain extent. So what we spoke about before, or what came up, was sustainability. And uh, I have similar question, but with different angles for both uh, you, Daniel, and Patrick. Um, so because there are some concerns about the sustainability of um, air mobility as a mode of transport for passengers um, and also for the delivery of cargo. Um, is UAM a truly sustainable mode in terms of energy efficiency? And if so, do you have some examples? So maybe, uh, Patrick, you could start with uh, taking over the more the passenger part. OK. Um, yeah, I think, well, the use space story is very interesting because it will not only connect to the air traffic management, but also at a certain point, I think, to your uh, traffic management at the, at, the, at the city level. If you then look at the sustainability, and Gerard, I think you posed really the right questions that for which we, I think, are not going to possibly here give you an answer of what is the right way to do. I think every city has to decide for themselves. So we work with the Dubai Future Foundation. In Dubai, they take completely different decisions on what they think uh, drones should be able to do in their city. Or it is in California, the State Office of California have other ideas about it, even if it's close to the European. But what we now see in the discussions is that the, I will not mention the, up, the, the drone producer that but they're going to fly between the fence and uh, Paris uh, <laughs> soon, next year. And when you ask them about how drones are going to solve uh, traffic congestion, I was like, okay, how is it going to solve traffic congestion? They tell me yeah, it's solving traffic congestion for the person that's sitting in that drone. So, okay, that's their, that's their view, or I don't know, maybe that's the way of how to forward, but I think as cities we have maybe another way of forward. But I just want to tell you again, this is, this is coming from the aviation situation, aviation industry. We're looking at it. The drone producers are looking at it. As cities, we have certain things to say about it. In the beginning, it will be not for the. It will be indeed for medical use cases, and will we have delivery drones? There is already a case in Ireland where they deliver coffees by drones. Uh, so that that's already taking place. And I think that we should, as cities, be able to be in that debate to say, okay, what do we actually want to achieve with it? It will start with medical service. They will be there. Kai spoke about sustainable urban mobility plans, but then we speak about thousands of movements of people uh, brought from uh, A to B or A to B to C. So for the moment, uh, urban air mobility will not be a real uh, mean of transport in that, uh, in, that, uh, in that planning. But this is something that will be coming. We start with medical. Then we start with logistics. And I think that as cities, we have to set the barriers. What do we like and what we do not like? Then sustainability. OK, let me uh, throw a little stone in the river. But uh, the Netherlands is one of these countries where we say that we cycle everywhere. I just read yesterday in the newspaper the country was not as much as congested as it was uh, ever. 
uh, just because we have more cars coming. So also all your sustainable modes, car sharing, carpooling, cycling, walking, are not going to solve congestion. It's just about better balancing the different modes in relation to the infrastructure that you have and to make that as sustainable as possible. So urban air mobility will be a new mode that comes now into the, 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 the choices of mode that we have. And for us to make the choice, okay, where do we put that urban air mobility? To say, okay, there, where do we want to, be, to have the barriers? Uh, uh, say, okay, next year, in five years, in 10 years, it will probably not be a grown up mean of transport of, uh, uh, of the whole mobility system. But uh, at, from that on, it will be. We have bigger engines, we will come. EASA brought out the VertiPort, uh, the guidelines on how to build VertiPorts in, uh, in your cities also. So I think there you have to have that uh, look at it. And then you have to look at the total business case. Not focus only, does it replace a bicycle by a drone or something like that. In a medical use case, drones are probably able to replace three, four medical laboratories which have also their own sustainable uh, uh, footprint. It can be at a certain point maybe replace a hospital or something like that in the north of Luxembourg. An ambulance can be there every time uh, that we want there, but it can replace another Luxembourg. So it might be more efficient, also from a sustainable point of view, to have maybe there a passenger drone bringing a doctor to the place uh, where it's needed. So it's a bit of a total story, but I would like to see this a little bit broader than just replacing a drone by something else. Uh, in mobility. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That's a very valid point. Daniel, would you like to add something on the cargo part when we speak about logistics and the delivery of coffee, where I already saw a reaction <laughs> there? <laughs> well, I think it's, uh, it's true that uh, this concept of the delivery, that maybe it comes something a little bit particular or that may be not useful in the beginning, but the idea is not only to move yourself, it's not to move, to stay and to receive services. That's also the idea. So in that way, you improve, if you don't move, you improve the mobility of the rest of the, of the city, right? For instance, I was coming by train this morning, and I was waiting for the Cordoba station, the, the last stop before Sevilla, and I was thinking about standing up and going to the, to the coach with the restaurant to take a for coffee. And when I was about to, to do that, a person with you know, a shopping cart came with, with the coffee to, to my seat. I said, oh, OK, so give me the coffee. So I, don't, I didn't have to move. So that's a, maybe a stupid example, but it's, it's the, the idea to, to that is not only to move that, not to move yourself and to and to receive some uh, services about the energy efficiency it's true that uh, for the electric part for drones or, or for air taxis nowadays we have a challenge with with the uh, electrical batteries uh, of course we know that the efficiency has to improve the battery weight capacity charging time okay but the reality is the electric motors, uh, according to some studies, uh, you need, for instance, in cars, 38 megajoules for, uh, to run 100 kilometers, and in a motor explosion, you need 142 megajoules, okay? Of course, there are other concepts, uh, the weight of the motor, etc., other kind of parameters, but it's true that we have the efficiency there for the, for the energy, and that's the reason that electric cars are also involving. And of course, to, to improve the, the, this sustainability uh, and the energy efficiency, you have seen drones with the new design that are not only rotors drones, that are hybrid uh, kind of propulsion, that they start the EVTOL operation, but they, they change to a lift using wings, that improve the, the energy efficiency. So this is something that also uh, is improving. Yeah, so and sorry, can I interrupt you? Because I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the term EVTOL. It's electrical, ver <laughs> electrical vertical, vertical takeoff and landing. Yeah. So that it starts really like this and goes down like this and not like this in aviation. Yeah, thank you for the element. Yeah. And last one, that in urban air mobility, you can fly straight in a straight line. So that's something also that it's improved the efficiency. 
Thank you. Yeah, it, uh, we see it's a very complex uh, topic uh, with a lot of angles and uh, points to, to to shed some light on. So we we already came to to the sustainability, and um, now another huge concern actually of citizens is the noise pollution. Uh, or also the affordability. So Kai, um, since EASA had this um, public acceptance study, uh, we, we saw that this uh, remains a critical factor. Um, are there other key factors that contribute to user acceptance of urban air mobility services and how can they be effectively addressed? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I think, I think when, what it comes down to a lot is, is building trust. Uh, and that, that, that's what, what, what we see. And of course, you know, that has different actors take different roles in building that trust. And, and as on the other side, of course, our, our role is there to ensure that from a technical side, uh, the, 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 the safety and the sustainability is ensured. And that, that's, of course, the, the elements that also EASA is working on. So we've, I've mentioned already the safety regulations that, that ensure that these things that fly up and down, and are a mix, really, of aircraft and helicopters with electric engines, essentially, with all the, the safety implications, so that, that they are safe. Um, as far as noise is concerned, which indeed came out very, as a very high concern, uh, we do, like we do for the big aircraft, uh, certain noise standards to make sure that building that trust by making things comparable, so that, that everybody knows, the city knows exactly how uh, a drone operation or a eVTOL operation would then actually you know, sound like in the city environment. And that's, that's a, what, what we are working on, to ensure that trust and give the basis for a decision. Uh, because these things don't fall from the sky, as it were. You know, there's, there's, there's uh, certif certification going on at, at, at European level, but then the decisions are made in the country, in the member states, for the authorization of a particular activity, uh, and the local uh, uh, authorities and the citizens are involved. In the use space regulation, that has been mentioned already, that it says explicitly in the regulation that uh, before you start an operation, you have to go out and involve uh, the community. Uh, so it's, it's really part of the approach. So these things don't fall from the sky. People are asked, and they only are, of course, going to be successful where they make sense. Yeah? So if you already have a great railway line, and you, know, you will not put an, an EV toll on top uh, as an additional service, um, um, unless maybe for sightseeing. But, but as a transport mode, it will be only successful where it integrates well with other modes of transport. It's about multimodality, um, and it will only be successful um, where, where it integrates well with this uh, kind of uh, other activities. Uh, we, we, we know some cities that, have, that are near fjord, you know, where there's, it takes f five hours to go around the fjord to another part of town, and then, you know, an uh, electric uh, aircraft can be a solution that is low, low impact and um, doesn't need investments in new railway lines, uh, because, of course, you know, if you build a railway line new, then also you're sinking a lot of CO2 and, and, and material in that. So these kind of things will be, it will be you know, part of the assessments that are in, uh, in, in available for when, when you do your planning in the, in the cities and um, um, areas. And that, all of that is there to, to build the confidence and the, and, and the societal acceptance um, uh, in building trust um, at the level that I mentioned, uh, the safety regulation, the privacy, you want to be sure that you know, you're not observed, the sustainability that I mentioned, where we have the noise standards, and we're working also on a sustainability standard. Uh, which means that we will be standardizing the way the full life cycle impact of these vehicles is measured. Uh, because we're flying around batteries, uh, let's put it quite, quite straightly. So, so um, of course, these batteries uh, you know, have been produced, materials went in there, um, no. CO2 went in there. So, so that, that standard is, is part of building the trust also for, from our perspective. That is very, very important. Um, security I mentioned already. And, Finally, everybody building that trust by having everybody working together links to uh, the, um, uh, one of the flagship actions, actually, of the, of the Commission's Drone Strategy 2.0, which is the, what we call the Innovative Air Mobility Hub. So everything we talked about now, uh, potential new means of transport, um, and we are building a platform uh, that, that will then allow citizens and cities to really uh, have this uh, independent information, how do we get started, what is really what, uh, what are really the impacts, what is the noise uh, figures. We put that all in one, uh, one stop shop 
uh, information that we call the IM hub. And uh, anybody who's interested, uh, feel free to approach me after the meeting or drop me a line afterwards. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that is very much needed because we also get a lot of requests from cities. cities. Where, can, where do I have to go? How do I start? Um, but this uh, I, I will ask Astrid later. But first, uh, Herd, you already uh, spoke about equity. Um, what do you think um, about the affordability? Do you want to add and elaborate uh, a bit more on that and uh, complement what Kai just said? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, it's important. I mean, we hear beautiful pictures here about Canada. Yeah, and also with respect to sustainability, maybe we don't have to build that hospital there and 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 uh, less use from to, to move from one thing to another. Now, if I want to move this with some wheels, it's normally that it takes much. I mean, it's basic physics. It takes less energy if I put it on a bicycle than if I put it on a drone with batteries, and it has to it has to fly higher. So it's not because it's electric that it is uh, sustainable. Um, so that's an important point. But then, with respect to, to to affordability and so on, I mean, and as cities, I think we we really should kind of think about from um, are we going to spend all this effort and this public space and and, and everything on that to um, move that few percentage of people. I mean, we, we, we mentioned there that the, the important people that need to get from A to one. So I mean, let's be honest, the rich people. I mean, basically, are we going to take the rich people? I mean, we're going to do all this infrastructure for 0.1 or 1% of the, the rich people and move them there and burden whole our city administration. I mean, our mobility people in the cities are already overworked, I mean, like hell. And now on top of that, they need to know everything about use space and about all these things and, and so on. I mean, this is going to be a nightmare for the cities. Do we really want our city staff to, to, to de be dedicated on that and not have time for all the other things? Hmm? While I was just walking from the hotel here this morning, uh, I was just kind of thinking from my, I was enjoying the shade of all those uh, trees here. Those trees are a big burden for all those uh, drones to deliver stuff. So, I mean, are we also now going to have some kind of rules about how you should kind of keep your trees not too big so that there is some space at the sidewalk that you can do this kind of thing? So all these things, I mean, so we really, I mean, as cities, we really have to think from do we really want to do that? And we need to avoid that we have a similar situation as we had with the e-scooters. E-scooters had also a fantastic promise. We were going to do these all kinds of things, and they just threw it out in our cities, and we have been, for years, we have been falling over those things and I mean, all this, the clutter around it, and now we're kind of fighting back. I mean, Paris threw them out already, and other cities are, are making other uh, rules. Much energy, much time from people in the cities, from the police to enforce all those things, uh, to get these things into a reasonable shape. Uh, so, I mean, before we let in those drones, I think, as a city, we really have to say, from, do we really want this? Do we really need this? Uh, and how are we going to, to limit that so that it's not only kind of a little upper class that, that enjoys it and that all the other people, most of the people here around in this, uh, in this meeting room, uh, will be kind of uh, undergoing the, the clutter of the city, those things flying above us, this, 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 this whole kind of thing. Let's keep a city. I mean, you mentioned noise. I mean, there are certain noise regulations, but that doesn't mean that it's quiet. It means that it, that it meets a certain norm. So but do we accept that norm? I mean, those kind of things. I'm not sure. So again, for, for, for real medical uh, applications, I mean, Yes, yes, and there might be very good uh, uh, things for drones, and I mean, on the safety, I'm, I'm not too worried. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that all the aviation things and so will, will cover that quite perfectly, so that's not the issue. But we really need to think, do we want to add that in our city? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so maybe, maybe it's busy, since yes. you're... Right, I like the conversation, right? And we continue after <laughs> that. But maybe just to let it not just go like this. And I'm not, you know, advocating for, you know, any of these operations. I'm, we're just observing, and we are we are making sure that it can be done safe and sustainably, mm -hmm. if we want it. Yeah? So, so I think the the um, what we do see is that I mean the the 
the interest comes from the cities. You know, that they have they have certain solutions. They have, it's very specific in certain areas. You know, it, I mean, the obvious ones we've, we've we heard from Astrid already. The, the efforts around you know linking hospitals. Uh, we know about some regions where it's all about connecting, uh, you know, more remote areas where there's no railway lines. Um, it's an it's an alternative to to put relatively quickly something in place if you don't have a rail links. Yeah? So these are the kind of things that we see. You know? As I said, I'm I'm not going going to you know um, to, to 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 promote this area, but just to 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 show the picture that it does come actually from from the bottom. Yeah? And this question that you're asking is it precisely the one that cities and regions have to ask themselves. Where does it make sense for us? Where does it add value in our region, in our city, in our specific, um, um, in specific areas? And then it actually, this ingenuity that we do see, I believe actually it's worth asking that question because there are solutions uh, that, that then fit to the specific solu uh, area that, that we do, do see. And, and uh, it's not only about, it is a lot also about emergency medical services, but it's, it's, there's many other use cases that we do see where we believe it, it does come from, from the cities. It's, not, it's, it's really not falling from the sky. It, it is coming mm -hmm. from you know, the, the cities and, and the solutions they want in, in these areas. Thank you very much, Kai. Uh, you already anticipated my next question to Astrid, because um, Astrid, you, you are managing basically Kassel as a city, but also um, North Van Hessen as a region, and you are also in the UIC2, the Urban Initiative for Cities and Communities. So what would you like to add on this, what has been discussed already from the cities and regions perspective? Yeah, thank you. I really enjoy this very vivid discussion. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think it's so important to be aware of and discuss this role, you know, yes. of cities and regions. And, and also I agree, I don't see it, I would have added exactly that, you know, I don't see it as just falling you know, the sky, and then here, now you have to deal with it, and I know they are overworked also in Kassel. <laughs> really, we can't come to that city department and say, hey, now, please, you have to deal with drones. And, but you know what that leads me to? It really leads me to, we have to empower cities and regions, you know, now. This is, empower them and not passively, you know, oh my God, now we have to deal with that, and we have to cut the trees, and all. what do we have to do? No, none of us wants that, I think. I'm sure I can speak for Emu, also the project we've been very much taking care of, um, you know, bottom up and then really identifying useful cases, medical emergency uh, services, for example, this is the Castle case, and then also the USC2 initiative, for example, is a very important um, voice also for cities and regions and platform on EU level. Um, where we can exchange our experience. And in Germany, we have the USC2 Germany chapter, of course. Um, it's a very uh, helpful platform because we as cities and regions on a monthly basis always exchange our learnings, um, but not only from the technical or technological perspective, but, you know, uh, engaging in public dialogue and, and really us who are, you know, the very persons who are part of that initiative really take all these concerns um, very serious, and not only serious, you know, as something you have to deal with it. And um, I think also, uh, I like your point you were talking about also earlier about, you know, it's like, is it it's some kind of trade-off between Verdi ports and then the beautiful parks? <laughs> so what we face really, it's not a trade-off, I think. And then again, I would like to stress my point about empowering cities and regions, because here, really, be a front-runner, be, you know, a change agent, be really somebody who's setting the scene and the agenda. And then I find it personally as somebody who is uh, trained in a long experience in innovation, innovation studies, innovation system building, I, th I think, and I know this is an interesting chance and opportunity now, and it's entirely new, you know, to the different spheres, because here what we see is we have to interlink urban planning, beautiful parks versus verde ports. Please don't treat it as versus, but and that chance and that role to integrate this in a, in a useful way is a role that cities can and will and have to take in regions. And then linking this, you know, with aviation regulation. So it's really fascinating because we are moving in a completely different and new and more complex field of actors and stakeholders in this very young and emerging uh, innovation ecosystem around UAM, so linking aviation regulation with urban planning. And on that whole ground infrastructure topic, of course, um, city regulators 
um, have, have the very important um, role to play. And I would just recommend from the, from the findings of our AMO project, from my experience from Kassel and Northern Hesse, to take this role as, yeah, as something very uh, leading and active and not at all passively. And I think we have reached um, now with these international projects, with our experiences from UIC, two very important findings so far. And we, we are in a state, you know, um, now to go into that implementation phase. So, so the rules of the game, basically, they are not yet decided and it's still very possible to, to become a very proactive player in this emerging um, UAM innovation system. Thank you very much, very engaging. Uh, Daniel, would you like to add something from your perspective? Yes, well, related to the engagement, uh, that is good news because um, US space regulation uh, for the first time, uh, and Kai also mentioned it, there is an obligation in the engagement of the regional, regional, uh, um, regional authorities and local authorities. So it's not only a matter of the decision of an state to, to deploy in some place this uh, US space, it has to be asked by the own city and the society. For instance, in Spain, we have transposed that in the National Action Plan of US Space. It's already published in, uh, under the Ministry of Transport uh, webpage. And we have the first, um, uh, um, the first meeting with the city of Benidorm because it's under a, a project, a European project, a you welcome project uh, for Spain is very important project. It's the flagship project for US space deployment in, in 2025. And Benidorm has been the first place when we uh, met all together, regional part, the local city, companies, citizens, uh, ev everyone. And we started to, well, to receive feedback um, about the, the future operation of, of US space in, in that specific location. So that's an example of, of the engagement or coordination with, with the society. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing all your different views from your different experience with us. I would like to open the Q&A session now. So please uh, keep asking them via Slido. Uh, and maybe because I just saw it here and it links perfectly, uh, which cities, countries, and companies are using use space? Are there best practices to share? So you just mentioned one uh, example in Spain. Yes, well, I have to mention that use space is not in place running uh, yet. Uh, the regulation get into force this January, but there are some countries that. Uh, among Spain is, is one of them that are trying to, to give you space services as soon as possible. But there are um, some things uh, yet to resolve with EASA uh, in order to, to get the certification. But, but, but we, are on, we are on the path. On the path, perfect. Astrid, Patrick, do you want to add? On the use space, and well, uh, it will be. <laughs> the second question, I can say something. <laughs> Maybe just compliment on space, and I, I think this yeah. is, this is uh, I mean, fresh off the press regulation, right? Uh, so, so the fact that, that that Spain is here really leading the way also to, to implement it uh, locally is really uh, is really um, uh, an, an, you know a rare case where you, where regulation and implementation is very very close to the actual technology uh, side. So I think this is quite quite a, let's say a European uh, um, a showcase of. of uh, following in innovation very closely and enabling it also because the regulation, of course, sets then the scene how these use spaces work. Huh? So, I mean, use spaces are like bubbles where then the, the delivery services can work automated, automated inside that, that space in a safe manner and in a very efficient manner. So that's, that's, that's quite, it's, it's, it's very, uh, in that sense, sophisticated. Uh, and we have seen many demonstrations of, of this uh, system and, and, and we are seeing now the first implementations going on uh, across Europe. Uh, so this is a European-wide effort. Okay, so Patrick, you already said you want to uh, answer the next question. What is the responsibility of local authorities to define the right use case? How can they handle that part? Well, I think, first of all, I'm very happy that now in the use space uh, regulation, uh, the obligation to look with local and regional authorities, okay, how we're going to set it up is set down. 
So the framework in that sense is, is put there that there is in some way or another going to be a uh, discussion going on. What are the right use cases? I think that you have to know that, for example, in Luxembourg, there are already 10,000 drone flights every uh, year, which are personal people, citizens, that fly with their own drones in the open category. So already there, the city looks at what's going on. How does it now work? OK, the, uh, the, the DAC, so our civil aviation services in Luxembourg, gets, for example, uh, information from the national or from the we're a very small country, or, or, or the local authorities that a certain manifestation will take place and that in that uh, time uh, of uh, the day or drones are unable to fly. So there is already there a communication between the, the local and the regional authorities and the civil aviation services. This will become with view space much more digital and much more in organized manner. This has to be set up, which we're still defining for that. In the Airmore project, we organize a master class on that. Mm -hmm. Let me do some promotion for that. <laughs> on the 23rd and 24th of November at the Euro Control Aviation Center, where we have aviation people and urban people actually helping lo local authorities to define, OK, what is the role of a policy officer uh, in a city uh, on urban air mobility? How does he deal with the 10,000 drones that are already there? How does he integrate the other things in it? Cities like Vancouver or uh, else in the States are already thinking about it. In North Hesse, I think that's also. So that's really something still to define, OK, how is this going to happen? And that is where I think the aviation uh, industry and also EAS is carefully listening also what comes up from the cities. OK, how do they say their responsibility and how that use case is going to be? Yeah, yeah react on that because you're looking at me with, with the 10,000 drones and things like that. that, that that's 30,000 nice. in Amsterdam. 30,000. How many of those were mobility? Yeah, that's a discussion about what is mobility. Yeah, I mean, all these drones, I mean, let's be very clear about drones and urban air mobility. These are totally, totally different okay. things. And we are, are here at the EU uh, Urban Mobility Days. I mean, that's a totally thing. I mean, that's a totally different thing. So. No, but I think, yes, no, but you're, you're agreeing, but I think that we spoke right there at the topic of drones. But something as a city, there will be probably some kind of a local policy officer looking at that topic. And that probably now that comes up with the logistics first. Mm -hmm. It's good that that person is also able to know, understand what, how he has to do with it. Yeah. yeah, this is exactly why we set up this panel. <laughs> 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 um, Astrid, do you want to add something on that question? Because it seems to be very important uh, to the audience as well. Um, yeah, I just agree. I mean, basically also with the masterclass and so on, everything very relevant. And yes, we're in that process in Kassel. Um, and I use that not only to promote, you know, our own project, but really this is the source now that we have developed. It's very new at the very frontier and it's very helpful. Um, and maybe also a step ahead, not only what is the responsibility, yes, that's true, and that we are in the process, but you said that already, uh, Patrick, it's in the process of also being defined, right? And this is so fascinating because we are all part of this very young, dynamic, um, emerging field, but so the responsibility even is something that is still in the process of being defined, at least um, how I experience this it in Kassel right now and um, to mention maybe also the example that when we were in the very process of defining our use case which is um, transporting frozen samples from um, hospitals to the pathology institute by the way with a very a uh, very passionate doctor who has the very ambition, of course, to save lives in this very case. But the local um, authority has been part of that very process and the responsibility um, so it's something about in that very process they were agreeing on, yes, this is what you may call the right use case. So it's so very early that they, we are just a small bunch of people, you know, in Kassel, maybe a handful of people who are now knowledgeable in that field and who are dealing with it on, a, yeah, uh, on the same level, more or less, exchanging our um, experiences in that very field and then defining together, agreeing in that field and also our organization as regional management, not in Hesse, we are a public, private uh, organization and we combine already in our advisory board also the city and the region. And here, very central uh, decisions are taking jointly in this very process. So it's not necessarily at this stage, you know, the, the external local um, authority who is deciding because we are in that group 
uh, yeah, who is, who is exchanging ideas and deciding on what could be a good use case, not could be, yeah, mm -hmm. is, uh, is a good use case. Thank you. Then uh, we have another question. Mm -hmm. or does anyone want to add? No, I'm just on the, on the question on the, on the mobility professionals. Yes. Uh, um, I think that what would, let me read it out. I think what I would be implications for, no, yeah, for mobility professionals' needs for skills and knowledge in UIM on sh short and long term? Yeah, I can I'll give it a start. I'm sure the colleagues will also have with, with the experience there uh, some, uh, some, some, some to, something to add. But I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a very important question because um, if you think it from a mobility perspective, which this whole what we've talked about is mm -hmm. only makes sense if you think it multimodal integrated. Um, and that means, of course, that mobility professionals across the board have to, have to get some basic understanding of what's the, what are the possibilities uh, and also convince the decision makers and, and explain to the decision makers what, what, is, what is the possibility in this space. Because there are, there are many, many uh, use cases that we've discussed this morning and there are many more out there. And of course, for some of them, you, you just need an understanding of the risk in a certain area and there will be a drone flying, you can authorize it within a couple of weeks. And others, you need a vertiport and you need to make investment decisions in your city where it makes sense or not. So, so there's, a, there's a, is a huge spectrum of, of sort of, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the needs there in that sense. But of course, you don't have to be a, uh, you know, an expert on all these elements, but it's, it's important to sort of broaden a little bit the understanding of what are the new possibilities out there. Uh, and also know, of course, where to, uh, where, where to find information that is robust. EASA is, is, is doing its bit there with the IAM hub, but, but there, there, of course, are many other actors that to play their role in terms of providing in, in information in this sense. A very good question. Thank you. Maybe also just to add a thought, you know, it could be maybe something entirely new position, but going out of this, now we have defined it as mobility professional, you know, but mm. it, it already, like our discussion has shown, entails so much more. It's at the interface of urban planning, of aviation regulation. It's complex. And maybe we can even install new positions. I don't know what they may be called. It's the UAM innovation manager or whatever, but it already implies that it's a set of skills that is new and that will be, you know, integrated in a new way also hmm. and not simply as add-on in existing sustainable urban mobility plans, hmm. for example. Hmm. Yeah, uh, this is uh, what we like to hear a lot. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Maybe the, um, the last question before I quickly will answer the one on research. Um, are city and aerospace governance structures resilient enough to ensure that UAM services are always implemented with a purpose. Um, anyone who wants to answer this question? Yeah, it's a topic. Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. that, uh, I think that the aerospace and the governance structures presently are very uh, resilient enough to decide based more on certification and the concept of operations uh, to decide if they want that flight or not. The question is, I think, about the purpose. I think that at this point, the cities are not resilient enough to, uh, to make a decision on uh, what they want and not want uh, in, the, in their city. So I think that there should be some uh, capacity building being done. You see it in every city emerging differently. So they appoint maybe a person that has, has some kind of responsibility urban air, urban air mobility. But I believe that we come to a point where uh, cities, at least already in the setup where drones will fly, will have a voice saying, okay, there will be, there we would like to have them and not to have them, because in the beginning discussions was, okay, where do we fly those drones that was on the places where the risk was the lowest, and that is necessarily where the least people are, and that's in general over parks <laughs> outside of the weekends then, but now already the discussion is about, okay, where they can fly not, so that, that's, an, that, that's already getting grown up, but that uh, we're growing up in, uh, in, in that area. And I believe that at a certain point, yes, yeah, cities will be able to say, okay, there we have it, there we not have it. Uh, and during uh, this manifestation is taking and not taking, uh, manifestation not taking place, we want to have it. We integrate the way vertiports in our urban planning. There we want to have the vertiports, there we don't want to have the vertiports that will be integrated with your noise, road, 
real uh, noise planning. Uh, what are we doing there with the citizens in all these discussions that you normally have also, where do you want to have roads, rules, and et cetera. Uh, and I think that will be a grown-up uh, grown discussion. So I believe that in uh, five, six years' times, when this becomes a really grown-up business and where commercial flights will take place, that if we follow this path where cities are also building up a bit of their knowledge on, on their side, they will be resilient enough to take that decision. Thank you. So, um, on the research question, yep. <laughs> um, most research projects in the EU um, on drones, use base, are actually funded in the CESA joint undertaking. This is and a good example is the Airmore project there. So, I really invite you to consult the uh, CESA JU work program topics. Energy distribution is more within the horizon Europe. Um, cluster 5 work program and telecom would be more cluster 4 but in in the context that we discussed today it's really CESA joint undertaking. Thank you very much. Um, I, we heard a lot today and we had a lot of different angles I think. Um, we, we heard that the first commercial flights will be available in two years so it's Coming back to my question I asked in the beginning, will, will, is it in the far future? I think we see it is really very, very near, and some cities are already doing something. We are in the process of getting the regulations and the certifications in process. We heard a lot about um, different use cases. Uh, I think the, the easy one to agree is really to the, the medical transportation system where we can avoid congestion, but will urban air mobility solve the congestion in cities on the ground? We heard probably not. So it's uh, also not a silver bullet, as we always say. Um, but for specific use cases, and I think what was really important there, um, also in terms of taking into account the, the sustainability and the batteries and the air pollution and all these things that cities face, it's really that uh, we, we should, uh, what I would take away today is, um, do we really need it? Do we want it? And this is a decision that the cities should decide. And for this, we really need to empower them, as Astrid said. So uh, I think this is uh, what we try to do here, and also with the UIC2 community on the European level, um, or the EASA IIM hub, who wants to bring like everything together. And unless you want to add anything else, we could uh, rush off for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Did I forget anything? Do you want to, to add something that you thought, oh, this I really want to say today? No? All good, all said and done. Then thank you very much for staying with us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.